Hey everyone and welcome back to Quick Medical Review. In this episode, we are going to talk about toxic thyroid adenoma. We will discuss how common is it, what's the mechanism behind it, how does it present in your patients, and then of course, what are the tools that you're going to need to diagnose it and then manage it effectively. But first things first, who does this condition actually affect? Now, it's not as common as some other thyroid conditions that are out there. But toxic thyroid adenoma still is something that you are likely to see in your practice and it tends to affect younger adults more often. In the United States, prevalence is around 5% of hyperthyroidism cases, most common in adults aged 20 to 40. But here's something that's kind of interesting. It incidence and prevalence varies across the world. A very significant risk factor, especially regarding the development of these adenomas, is iodine deficiency. And, you know, think back to your basic endocrinology. Iodine is essential for making thyroid hormone. When your body doesn't have enough of it, well, the thyroid gland can start acting a little off. Toxic thyroid adenomas are benign tumors. They are not cancerous. They overproduce thyroid hormones. They completely ignore the signals from the pituitary gland. And the result is hyperthyroidism. So picture your patient's metabolism. Picture this scenario for a second. A younger adult walks into your clinic and they're complaining of just feeling overheated all the time, even when everyone else is comfortable. They mention feeling restless, anxious, maybe their heart is racing for no obvious reason. And despite having, you know, a healthy appetite, they've been losing weight. Sound familiar? Well, these are all classic symptoms of an overactive thyroid. Occasionally, patient can complain of compressive symptoms like hoarseness dysphagia or dyspnea. Hold on a second, it could point to a number of conditions, right? So this is where your diagnostic skills really come into play. You need to be able to sort through these and tell the difference between toxic thyroid adenoma and other conditions that can kind of mimic it. Let's take a closer look at, you know, when you're doing a physical exam, what are some of the things that might tip you off? During physical exam, you may find patient to have tachycardia, lid lag, warm moist skin, tremor and possible proximal muscle weakness. There will be no exophthalmos or pre-tibial maxodema distinguishing it from Graves' disease. Feeling for any nodules on the thyroid gland is going to be really essential. And listen carefully because you might even hear a soft whooshing sound which is called a brew And that's a telltale sign of increased blood flow to the gland. And we often see that with hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease. But here's the thing, even if you feel a nodule, don't jump the diagnosis. You can't make a complete diagnosis based on a hunch alone. We need some concrete evidence, right? And that means turning to lab tests and imaging. So what's your first line of investigation? Well, the TSH test, of course, and a suppressed TSH level, that's going to be your first clue for hyperthyroidism. Because remember, the pituitary gland, it tries to, you know, stops TSH production when it senses that there are too many thyroid hormones floating around the bloodstream. But a suppressed TSH doesn't tell you the whole story. It's basically just saying, hey, something's up with the thyroid. Next up, we're going to check the thyroid hormone levels themselves. So your free T4 and your free T3, those are your go-tos here. And don't forget to check TSH receptor antibodies. If someone has high levels of TSH receptor antibodies, it typically indicates an autoimmune condition such as Graves' disease. Now, if those tests come back and they're showing elevated thyroid hormone levels, negative TSH receptor antibodies or with palpable nodule, it's time to consider nuclear medicine scan. Thyroid uptake scan. This is where the toxic or non-toxic thyroid adenoma really becomes apparent. The scan will often reveal a single hot nodule. This is a region that basically takes up the radioactive iodine, the surrounding thyroid tissue, often appears suppressed due to this overactive nodule. Now typically this combination of findings is enough to really seal the diagnosis of toxic thyroid adenoma. But remember those mimickers we talked about earlier. There are other conditions out there that can actually present with similar symptoms and even similar findings on a thyroid scan. So let's talk about some of those mimickers for a second. You know, those conditions that can kind of cause confusion and make you think, is this toxic thyroid adenoma or is this something else? Right at the top of that list is Graves' disease. Now like toxic thyroid adenoma, 
Graves' disease causes hyperthyroidism. But here's the distinction with Graves' disease. It's the entire thyroid gland that is overproducing thyroid hormones instead of one nodule. So what does that mean for your thyroid scan? Well, you won't see just a single hot nodule. The whole gland will light up. Plus, Graves' disease often comes with some other telltale signs of exophthalmos or pretibial myxodema. In addition, TSH receptor antibodies can be high. Now another condition to keep on your radar, especially when you're dealing with older patients, is toxic multinodular goiter. And as the name suggests, instead of just having one overactive nodule, we're talking about multiple hotspots showing up on that thyroid scan. So you can see how accurate diagnosis really requires you to put all the pieces together, right? Okay, so let's say you've nailed the diagnosis. What comes next? How do we actually manage toxic thyroid adenoma? Well, here's the thing. Unlike some other causes of hyperthyroidism, which might just, you know, resolve on their own, toxic thyroid adenoma usually needs some kind of definitive treatment to permanently cure the overactive nodule. We can use antithyroid medications like carbamazole or radioactive iodine therapy, or we could do surgery. Each option has its own, you know, set of pros and cons, and the best approach is really going to depend on a few things. The patient's age, whether they have any other health conditions going on, the size of that nodule, and of course, what their own personal preferences are. Radioactive iodine therapy is the mainstay treatment, especially for adults who aren't pregnant. It is relatively straightforward, and most patients tolerate it quite well. So how does it work? Basically, the radioactive iodine goes to the thyroid gland and specifically targets and destroys those overactive cells in the nodule. And it's remarkably effective at curing hyperactive nodule. But like any medical intervention, we do have to, you know, consider the caveats, right? Radioactive iodine therapy, it's not for everyone. Pregnant and breastfeeding women, for example, need to look at other options because of the risks associated with, you know, radiation exposure to a developing fetus or a baby. Radioiodine treatment can also result in developing hypothyroidism afterward. But the good news is hypothyroidism is actually very easy to manage. We can just use thyroid hormone replacement therapy. Okay, so on the other end of the spectrum, we have surgery. And typically, the procedure that we would do is called a subtotal thyroidectomy. The major advantage of surgery is that it provides really quick relief from the hyperthyroidism. Now, of course, as with any surgery, there are some inherent risks involved. Things like infection, bleeding, there's a small chance of damaging the vocal cords or the parathyroid glands. But thankfully, these complications are pretty rare, especially in the hands of an experienced surgeon. So when do we usually reserve surgery for toxic thyroid adenoma? Well, it's often reserved for, you know, specific situations. For example, individuals who aren't good candidates for radioactive iodine therapy. Maybe they have a really large nodule that's causing some compressive symptoms like difficulty swallowing or difficulty breathing. Or, you know, some people just prefer surgery over the other options. And that's perfectly fine too if they make decisions based on informed choice. Now, lastly, let's talk about antithyroid medications. Now, they don't actually get rid of the nodule itself, but they can be really effective in controlling those overactive cells and bring thyroid hormone levels back to a more normal range. And these antithyroid medications are really valuable in certain situations. For example, they're often our preferred first-line treatment for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. And that's because they're considered safe for both the mother and the baby which is obviously really important during those critical periods. Now, it's important to note that antithyroid medications often require, you know, long-term use, sometimes even years, to really keep those hormone levels within a normal range. And as with all medications, you know, there is the potential for side effects. Some are more common than others, things like skin rashes, maybe some liver enzyme abnormalities. And then very rarely, there's even a chance of a drop in white blood cell count which could increase the risk of infections. So the big takeaway here is that, you know, deciding on the best treatment for toxic thyroid adenoma, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. It's a conversation, it's a collaboration between you and your patient. So, what is the prognosis? The good news is the prognosis for toxic thyroid adenoma is generally really good. You know, once we get that hyperactive nodule under control, most patients do really well, 
and they can go on to live totally normal lives. One thing that we always want to keep an eye on is the possibility of hypothyroidism developing after treatment. And this is especially true after radioactive iodine therapy or surgery. And that's why regular thyroid function tests are really, really important, especially in those first few months after a patient has finished treatment, because hypothyroidism can be easily managed with thyroid hormone replacement therapy. With radioactive iodine therapy, the nodule can shrink significantly. Now, even with surgery, where we're physically removing the nodule, there's always a tiny chance that it could come back. It's very rare, but it can happen. Therefore, monitoring thyroid function tests is important to monitor if treatment is successful. If a toxic thyroid adenoma is left untreated, several complications can arise. The patients can develop atrial fibrillation, which increases the risk of stroke. Older individuals with untreated subclinical hypothyroidism are about three times more likely to develop cardiac dysfunction, including atrial fibrillation, over 10 years compared to euthyroid individuals. Hyperthyroidism can also lead to osteoporosis due to increased bone turnover. Therefore, it is important to consider treatment in toxic thyroid adenoma. This wraps up our discussion on toxic thyroid adenoma. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Quick Medical Review. I hope this recap on toxic thyroid adenoma has been helpful. Be sure to subscribe and join us next time for another concise medical review.